Common sense from my next guest as well, Conservative commentator Benedict Spence. He joins us always on a Wednesday. Good morning to you. Good morning. You may be disappointed, but <laughs> <laughs> let's just plough on anyway and hope for the best. Let, let's talk about Hezbollah, prescribed terrorist uh -huh. group, but not to the BBC. Of course not. There is no, there is no terrorist group the BBC is apparently seems to think is anything other than mm. an armed group. Why have you got arms? Oh, <laughs> because you're firing them into another country well, because have you have terrorist aims. Maybe you're a terrorist group. Just throwing that out there, BBC. Just throwing that out there. They don't there. have as many arms as they used to this morning. No, they, <laughs> they, do, they do not. I mean, Is there it is okay some... to laugh at a mass casualty event if it involves oh. a terrorist organisation? You're absolutely allowed to laugh and indeed cheer. It's like yes. the really weird people when we know Osman Laden was killed and, mm. uh, and Saddam Hussein. You know, I'm literally like, brilliant. This is great news. Yeah. Fantastic. One less psychopath in the world. And people go, you should... Every human life is sacred. Mm. You should not... No, the world is definitely a better place without these people in it. Yeah. I don't know why people find this complicated. I remember when Al Baghdadi was assassinated mm. in the New York Times. Was it the New York Times or the, or the, uh, the Boston Globe, whoever it was, uh, called him an austere religious scholar? And John yeah. Trump went and gave perhaps the funniest announcement I've ever seen, announcing the assassination of a very bad guy, died like a dog, and you could not have possibly yeah. got no, exactly. the worst well, job. I mean, you're saying, like now we're told, 11 people have died. Look, one of those is, is a child, yeah. uh, the child of, of a Hezbollah fighter. I mean, that is very, I always, you know, would always mourn the death, uh, death of an innocent child. It was not their fault what their, their father was doing. But mm. again, again, we're told constantly, you know, Hamas attacks, uh, uh, you know, and, uh, sorry, Hamas uh, deaths in uh, uh, under in Gaza. That oh well, it's not. They're not Hamas fighters. They're all women mm. and children. Miraculously, there's never been any images uh, of of, a, of any Hamas fighters mm. being killed. This was quite clearly aimed at uh, Hezbollah attackers. Now, the key thing here is is. What could have caused this almost simultaneous explosion of pages across mm. the country? It happened in, you know, the, the Iranian, you know, ambassador in Iran, in Syria, and mm. elsewhere. Various different theories about Israel, who of course have not claimed <laughs> responsibility, but clearly this has got everything. Well, this has got Mossad <laughs> written all over it. Yeah. But are clearly going to be behind us. Whether or not they placed a, an explosive device, intercepted them in delivery, mm. or, or whether or not there was perhaps a, some sort of message that would overheat the lithium battery. Yeah. But the key thing here is that. These pages had been decided a few months ago. Mm. There was a decision, especially after Hezbollah leaders had been killed, tracked by their mobile phones, yeah. that stop using mobile phones, we're going to use pages. It's a safer way. You can't be tracked using GPS technology. It's a safer way of, yeah. of, of, of keeping contact. Um, ironically, not. Yeah, I mean, the, the suggestion being that this was part of the calculations by the Mossad or whoever it might have been when they decided to assassinate Ismail Haneya and other members of Hezbollah and Hamas um, across the Middle East is knowing therefore that targeting smartphones would mean that they would revert to something a bit more rudimentary. Y if you already have the plan in place to intercept the rudimentary, uh, rudimentary objects and systems then you've got them basically and you yeah. just wait until they're everybody's sort of um, at ease. Um, and, but these and were and apparently only distributed in the last few days. And this is the point, is that it, it, they can act very quickly, they can inter they're very opportunistic. It's not necessarily that something that's sort of gone months into planning, but that they can do it very quickly and then operate very quickly yeah. um, within a, a, a very broad range, it must be said. I mean, it's a huge number of people who have been incapacitated. One this is the key in thing. 30 Hezbollah yeah. you know, operatives were hit yesterday. And presumably quite senior, to have all been part of the same network yeah. of pages to all be linked to each other. And as you say, it's sad that a child has died, and it'll be sad that civilians have died, but if you decide, knowingly, if you've got children, to yeah. get involved in an organisation like this, and you decide to sabre-rattle it, I don't know, a country like Israel, which is you know, famous for being really placid about people who threaten it, I mean, what do you what, expect? What did you expect? No, exactly. those, really... Again, those people put their, their, yeah. their children at risk. But here's the, thing, here's the key thing. The repercussions of this are, I mean, being discussed, we're, whether or not we're in a situation where you know, the, the, this technology will be used by someone else, like Vladimir Putin, could be used, you know, against us. Mm. Whether or not um, this, you know, this could actually lead to a massive ramping up of uh, uh, tensions mm -hmm. in, in, the, in, the, in the region. Whether or not actually this is a precursor by Israel choosing to do this now deliberately because mm. uh, they're going to, they're expecting to disrupt things and then they're going to uh, move, you know, move into the southern Lebanon. But the key thing here, of course, is we have only recently the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu saying that the war aims are no longer defeating Hamas and getting the hostages mm. back. It is also to basically get Israeli citizens back to where they belong yeah. uh, in northern Israel. Yeah, and the, of course Hezbollah have been menacing people for a very long time, but it's it, it's an interesting thing to try to uh, judge whether or not Hezbollah actually wants a conflict or not. It's spoken, it's talked a tough game about how many rockets they have, how many personnel they have, what they're going to do, and right off the back after October 7th there was this suggestion that, oh, if Israel goes into Gaza, Hezbollah will bring the war to their 
their northern border. They fired a lot of rockets, it's true, but let's be clear. Hezbollah does not want this fight, actually. It has done w everything within its power to avoid actually getting Israel to invade. It could well, have started apart firing... from firing no, no. rockets into northern Israel? Over the hundreds, of, uh, hundreds of thousands of rockets that they have is entirely for deterrent. And this is, the pro and this is part of the problem with organisations like Hamas or Palestinian Islamic Jihad. Not everybody actually has complete control over everything that goes on all at once. This was one of the issues that they're having in terms of identifying where the hostages are uh, in Gaza. Is that It's all very well if Israel says, we want X, Y, Z number of hostages and Hamas go, no, you can't have them, and it's sort of sotto voce because we don't know where they all are. Different groups have different ideas about what you should be doing. That's a similar issue that you have in Lebanon right now. Lebanon, in basically all of its political factions, are very fractured, very yeah. chaotic, and that's partly why Hezbollah does not actually want this invasion. It needs to save face, but it cannot survive an invasion by the IDF at this point because actually well, all of Lebanese society would collapse behind it, it if it, it did, happened. And, it did, and again, we get into the situation. Israel has been you know has been in what five wars since mm. its inception all of them started by arab neighbors mm. and they have been won on every single occasion by israel they're quite good they're, they're really quite good at it. Yeah. and you know it, because because it is existential for israel and that's mm. a crucial thing that we'll be talking about the show, the show i'd love to hear your thoughts on this as well because there are lots of implications of this in terms of what happens and are we going to see middle east tensions ramp up that will have massive impacts you know, militarily around the world that has impacts that we've got you know it has impacts on the american election for the mm. states which has impacts on us impacts on the on the economy uh, in terms of fuel prices uh, oh no sorry david lammy explained yesterday climate change is what we have to worry about not war uh, not terrorism um and and of course it, the wind and the sun because the sun today is absolutely powering every bit of electricity we're using in the studio right now of course it is i mean i mean we're living in mad territory aren't we but i'd love to hear your thoughts on this your reaction to this um also want to hear your your thoughts on the, on another topic i've asked you to to get in touch on this but first up just some breaking news uh, the chief executive of the post office nick reed is to step down he has resigned from his role. We'll get some more information on that as it comes in. Uh, but that's the chief executive of the post office, Nick Reed, is to step down. I can't get it. I'm another just totally incompetent in that role. Um, but there we are. Um, let's also talk about uh, migration. <clears throat> major story. I don't see a point when it won't be a major story. Yesterday, we gave a little round of applause mm. to Keir Starmer as he very successfully saw 10,000 channel migrants arriving in the country. Uh, well done, him. Um, uh, you know, in just, in just since he's come into power, I mean, you know, a major achievement. Now, look, nobody expected at all that we were going to see, you know, him dealing with the channel migrants immediately. Mm. Of course, no one thought that was what was going to happen. However, um, he's gone off to meet Giorgio Maloney in Italy mm -hmm. and uh, he's looking at different options on what can be done to tackle uh, channel migrants and, of course, already upsetting the uh, the lefties in the Labour Party. Some, some you know, Labour MPs are very unhappy already about, you know, him talking to Giorgio Maloney. They see her as far right. Some even use the term, um, uh, uh, was it, um, a fascist, literal fascist about her. Um, but um, the new border chief, Martin Hewitt, has said that um, smashing the gangs is not in itself going to be enough mm. uh, to halt migrants. Um, he, a Whitehall source has revealed that uh, he told the Prime Minister his plan to smash the gangs won't be enough. Uh, and he admitted he can't stop the boats without a deterrent. And deterrence apparently was always going to be part of the overall picture to end the crisis. Mm. But what is the deterrence because fundamentally there is this draw um we don't have id cards here mm -hmm. that's not really an argument for us to have id cards the rest of us but they, we don't you know you can work in the illegal black market well, much more easily come into the country we, you can start. you get given a hotel you get given a hotel accommodation yeah you get given you know um a benefits in a way that you when you're in a tent uh, in Calais otherwise mm. but also people know people who are already here because mm -hmm. we let so many stay <clears throat> uh, and of course a lot of people will have a, a greater grasp of English and any mm -hmm. other language in Europe so there are lots of different reasons why they're but basically we see it as a soft touch yeah because we are um, ultimately there is no deterrent without deportations being on the table and given the numbers of people that are coming into the country illegally uh, the phrase mass deportation would probably have to be used because it would be tens if not hundreds of thousands of people who have entered the country illegally that's the only deterrent that's part of what Rwanda was, not actually deporting them straight away, but moving them offshore. And it's that sort of dangling the threat of not actually getting to Britain in the first place or being taken straight out of Britain somewhere else that was supposed to be the deterrent. And as much as most of us would agree Rwanda in itself and the way that it was conceived and the way it was being implemented was probably not going to work, it is interesting that half of the countries in Europe are also looking at similar schemes. Without that deterrent, people are just going to keep on coming in because they will assume that even if their claims are denied, the state will never get around to getting rid of it, which, to be well, fair, they, it's not they really do, doing it's not, that. No, 
yeah, but also so, it's not that they believe it is the case. Yes, exactly. So, and, and there's no reason to think that Labour aren't going to allow uh, yeah, yeah, all so, the people already here to so stay. So if there is no threat of being returned to your own country or another country somewhere else, people are just going to keep on coming, yeah. regardless of whether or not, if you're approved, you get all of the wonderful benefits there are on offer. Yeah. At the very least, if you're going to offer that, there has to be the threat dangled over a significant number of those people that you yeah. might not get those things straight away. You might go somewhere else. We don't have that in this country. And I don't see any suggestion that the Labour Party are going to be the ones to do they, that. They do not, look, I mean, we thought that the Tory party had the political will, but the inability to do it in the open business. Yeah. We thought we thought that they talked a good game, but they didn't necessarily do it. Um, but but I don't even think that Labour have any political will well, to do it. The National Crime Agency yeah. has always taken this view. They've consistently uh, said very, very, very clearly um, that, um, that, that basically, unless we actually have um, no, um, a, a, a deterrent, mm. no amount of law enforcement activity will actually halt the smuggling gangs. There is mm. too much money at stake and too many people who want to come here. Well, I mean, the, but ironically, it's not just you, you were saying the Tories didn't have the will to do it. Nigel Farage yesterday did an interview where he said, I don't want to talk about mass deportations. I don't think. And that, I think, tells you where this country is. Even though we all kind of know what the solution is, we all know what the deterrent is, nobody is prepared to say it because they know I, the response will be shrill hysteria yeah. about human rights abuses. I, know. I, and I do want mass deportation. I don't, not, not in the sort of the but, way that they did, the, yeah. the far righty lot talking about, you know, and you want to come. Nothing that I couldn't care less about. I, I literally have no interest mm. in people's colours, totally irrelevant. But in terms of, the, the, it is estimated that you know, more than one and a half million, probably two mm. million people in this country are here illegally. Yeah. They've overstayed their visa, they've come here on a work, student visa or a visa and they're here or they just got their way into the country mm. another way. I'm sorry, I, I don't care whether your kids are at school. Mm. I, I don't care. You have no right to be in this country. I don't think you should be here. We should absolutely have mass deportation. So simple much. And yeah. I really also think that anyone who comes here to live here, even if you've got residency here permanently, mm. if you commit a serious crime, and I mean anything pretty much over a speed, uh, over a ticket. speed ticket, <laughs> yeah. yeah, you're yeah. out. First time, you're out. You don't. We've got enough wrong ones of our own. We I don't agree. need to import them. You don't get the same privileges of the British citizens. We have to put up with our own wrong ones, mm. um, you know. But no, I would have that. And then that's not that's not a far right view. That's not a fascistic view. That's not a racist view. I couldn't care less whether you're Australian, mm. whether you're from Pakistan. I don't care mm. if you commit crimes here or if you're here illegally. I don't want you here anymore. And I have no issue whatsoever. I'll lead the vans round people up if necessary and you can have as many crying children mm. and weeping women and saying oh woe is me oh woe yeah. is me but we've got a cat here and and but i've but my pot plants will die uh if you don't no i don't i don't have a right to go and just live in any other country i feel like living in and those people don't have a right to live here i we we don't need those people they're and not a net they're not a net gain for and us and most countries most countries if not all countries that i can think of share that attitude yeah. it's only this country where we think it's a bizarre violation of human rights but but, you know, Keir Starmer is currently talking to the Italian Prime Minister, Giorgio Maloney, who's being branded this, you know, a fascist by people who have no concept of what Italian fascism is. But actually, she is to the right of where governments have been there for a very long time in Italy. It's mm. been gradually going that way. But it has always been the law in Italy that even if you are born there, if your parents aren't Italian citizens, you don't yeah. just get citizenship. You don't just get those yeah. things. You have to take a citizenship test when you turn 18. Yeah, well, the citizenship otherwise, test here is otherwise, weird. Well, exactly. It's in weird, Italy, it's, it's like quite... knowing some completely random stuff that most people who've been to school here don't know. Most but countries, not actually saying, do you have the value, for instance, that people can exercise their right to free yeah. speech? You Italy, know, France, are. Germany, these countries, they have proper citizenship tests, and in the case of Italy, certainly, they're very stringent about this. If you're yeah. not going to sign up to everything that we offer you, and that includes all the you know the, the demands that are made of you, you don't have to stay here. You can go back there, yeah, and exactly. it's in your interest, therefore, to play along. Get in touch. I'd love to hear from you on this. Britain's new border chief has warned Keir Starmer his plan to smash the gangs will not be enough to halt channel migrants. I mean, <laughs> imagine everyone's surprised. What is your reaction to that um what is going to be enough i know we've talked about this so many times but this is still an ongoing issue Ten thousand more channel migrants ha largely young men have arrived in this country since keir starmer became prime minister uh, give us a call on 0344 499 1000 you can text on 8722 get in touch on x at talk tv calls to charge at the national rate text cost one standard network rate message um now um post i just remind you the breaking news uh, post office chief executive nick reed is to step down from the road He'd already temporarily stepped back from the role in July to prepare for the next stage of the Horizon scandal inquiry, which, of course, is still ongoing. Uh, the, he, the current um, interim chief operating officer, Neil Brocklehurst, is going to uh, replace uh, uh, Nick Reid uh, on an interim basis. Um, 
Uh, but again, I mean, that, that, that scandal just continues, does it not, um, Benedict? I mean, I don't see that going away anymore. Basically, anyone involved at any point up to this point mm. has, uh, uh, well, you know, uh, uh, is implicated. I mean, given that we've got, you know, we're still not you know, at the end of this. The, People of the still inquiry. haven't yeah. had their payouts. Yeah, I, I suspect this is probably for the best, actually for uh, post office as much as anything else, yeah. because it cannot be operated by people who have got one eye on this sort of ongoing. Yeah. I think it's probably in everybody's best interest. As much as you want to say people who are in charge when the mess is made should be sort of helping to clear it up, there does come a point where you go, they OK, can't. but the broader service has to keep going, especially yeah. seeing as the post office has so many competitors now in this country. Uh, so I think it's probably for the best. But as you say, my word, it's just this ongoing, and it's so often the case with institutions in this country, is that there are X, Y, Z, so many yeah. things wrong, and then the inquiries take forever. But we never actually learn. It's always, the resolution is, lessons must be learned. What they lessons? Never are, yeah. Air. Who remembers? Yeah, exactly. Is there, there, some other scandal of some scale will be going on right now, which we'll find out about in oh, 10 yeah, years. my pension. And, and then and taxpayers <laughs> will be footing the bill. Yes, yeah. again. Let's talk about teachers. Um, must we? This story just blows <laughs> my tiny little mind, <laughs> as so many people will point out on, on social media. Teachers, I mean, just, just, just get your head around this one. Teachers are to be allowed to work from home under Labour Party, along with the whole of the social civil service, Whitehall, everybody else. You're allowed to work from home under Labour plans to tackle the recruitment crisis in schools. Head teachers would be told they can let their staff do marking and planning away from the classroom. They already have free periods. They're not teaching every hour of every day. Mm. They've got time to you know, sit and, and, and mark homework to plan lessons, often, by the way, in, in an empty classroom in silence or, or in the, or in the, uh, the staff room. Um, basically, they're worried about the number of women leaving the profession, basically, when they have children. Um, uh, 32,000 left in the last academic year, um, they basically they could take their free periods in blocks at the end or the beginning of the day mm -hmm. and then they could work from home they could, while looking after children or to complete the school run. Now, I'm sorry, but I know that <laughs> teaching is a hard job. Yeah. Doing it well is an even harder job. Mm. Not everyone does it well. But uh, the free periods aren't, you don't organise a teacher, a French teacher or a P teacher's free periods around mm. when they want to collect their kids from school, right? You organise that. Uh, around what you know, what, what, what all the classes the kids are doing, mm. um, and you might have, you might have an hour free on a Tuesday morning and two hours free on a Thursday afternoon. But no, you can't take that all on a Friday afternoon. Yeah. Here's the thing: you also can't ma mark maths homework mm. whilst looking after a four-year-old. Yeah, this is, I find this absolutely astonishing. Also, teachers work long hours during term time. Mm -hmm. We get this oh, they have to work a forty-five-hour week. Well, yeah. Yeah, it's a tough job. It mm. is, does involve a lot of work. Um, but you know how every six weeks you get at least a week off and you get 13 weeks off. And don't tell me you work every single holiday. I've got friends and family who are teachers. They don't work every week of the holidays or anything like it. This is an absolute nonsense. One of the reasons why people, when they have kids, a lot of women do work in teaching and mm. stay in teaching is because they can then have the time off with their kids during mm. the holidays. And now we're saying they're working too hard during the school term. I mean, I do have some sympathy for this. Having once been a British schoolboy, I wouldn't want to be in a room with me either. And I imagine that there are many like me. So I did wait for you to take that since so, that exact so moment. I was really hoping you would spill my tea. tea everywhere. <laughs> it so nearly came off. Um, I mean, there is one aspect of this that I think is uh, slightly unfortunate, which is uh, who could possibly have foreseen coming that a profession that leans heavily on, f on women, young women, uh, to do most of the work yeah. and doesn't actually actively go out and seek for men might find itself in a bit of an issue when all of those women decide that they would like to, you know, do that yeah. normal biological thing and contribute to the classes that they yeah. themselves Maybe are teaching. Maybe people who work with children quite want to have their own. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, but this is... Well, I think we, my daughter's primary school, I think we lost like five teachers in one mm. term to go and have babies. Yes, well, yeah. surprisingly, it happens. Um, and, and as I said, this is something, again, that has been pointed out for a very long time. And people often used to talk about it in terms of, oh, well, boys at school, they need male role, role models. Yeah. No, on a purely practical level, you need men to take over a lot of the heavy lifting if a large number of women go on maternity yeah. leave, which, surprise, surprise, they do. And often well, a lot decide not to come they back. Want to, they don't want to work full time well, office, they don't, And a lot of people also don't want to come back. I know that lots of people say, oh, no, it won't change me and my career will be the important lot, thing. But yeah. a lot, lot of women of don't like to come back on the same terms that they no, did No, last exactly. Time. But again, I just think we need more men in the classroom. I never understand. I care absolutely not at all about the number of women who are on FTSE mm. 100 company boards. I care 100% how many women, how many yeah. men there are in the classroom. So many young girls and boys don't have good male role models at yeah. home. They don't have the community and they don't have them at school. Uh, only 4% of teachers at primary schools are men. That, I mean, that is a national scandal. What is going on there? I mean, again, a lot of those men, a lot of men don't want to work in primary yep. schools because there is often you're having to cuddle the kids if there's a trauma or, you know, there's an upset. And they are so terrified of the false accusations of that course. go against them. They don't want to go there. But there we are.